Good evening and God bless you one and all. This is Apostle Joel P.W. Reed, Prince of Peace Ministries International. We are in the first month of, the, of this very pivotal and significant year, 2020. We're in the month of January. Today is January the 15th. Shalom and greetings to one and all. In the name of Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus Christ, our soon coming King. I want to look at some verses in Hebrews chapter 11. In fact, it's been laid upon my heart to go through this entire chapter, but I'm going to do it in different stages, looking at certain characters in this very powerful and revelatory piece of scripture. I'm going to read from verse 1, so follow along with me. Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. So we're going to start with Abel. Now Abel was the second son of the first couple, Adam and Eve. Cain was, of course, the firstborn. Now, the backdrop of this particular scripture is that Adam and Eve have been put out of the Garden of Eden, but they were covered by lambskin, which is the grace of God. Grace was given unto Adam and Eve before they exited the Garden of Eden. I would like to also state that animals were not yet vicious at this time. You have to understand, man was a complete vegetation eater. He, only, he was an herbivore, eating only plants, fruits, vegetables, herbs. No meat. No meat was consumed. So, what happened was this. Adam and Eve taught their sons how to make sacrifices unto God. Because the first sacrifice was actually done in the Garden of Eden. Because a lamb was slain so that Adam and Eve could have clothing over their private parts. Then they were expelled out of the Garden of Eden but they were covered by grace. So Adam knew how to make sacrifices unto God in a way that was pleasing to the, to the Lord. And so they taught their sons. Now, even though they, humans were herbivores at this time, right up until the flood, and if you recall, it's after the flood that man was given permission to eat meat. And so the animals, they went hostile and and that's when everything was carnivore, optivore, herbivore. An optivore, of course, is an animal that eats both plants and animals like bears, for example. Now, knowing then how to approach God in a way that's pleasing unto Him, there came a time when they, these two sons had to worship. Keep in mind, Watch this. Both boys were, by and large, good boys. But God knows the end from the beginning. So they were growing up in a family. Also keep in mind, Adam and Eve, Eve had sons and daughters way after Cain and Abel. This is how Cain and Seth that followed Abel could have children, obviously. But this was at a time when it was just Cain and Abel. At least they were the only ones 
that were mentioned as children of Abel, oh, sorry, Adam and Eve. All right then. They both know how to offer unto God a good sacrifice. Blood must be spilled. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And because sin was introduced into the human race, God had to kill a lamb. There had to be a substitute of a pure animal to cover the sins of mankind. And so God did the first sacrifice and set the tone and the, set and, and the pattern for what is acceptable as sacrifice for sin. So both Cain and Abel were sinners. I want to make that clear. They were good, but as King Solomon said, there is not a man upon earth who is just, not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. The only one that ever did that was Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. God with us, God in human form. In fact, one lawyer came to Jesus and said, My Lord, good master, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus said, Why callest me thou good? There's only one good, and that's God. You see that? So Jesus was in fact telling that lawyer, If I am good and I'm perfect, I must be God. You see? So God had a perfect sacrifice that he had intended to take away the sins of the world. And this wasn't done at the time when Adam and Eve sinned. This lamb was slain from before the foundation of the world. So God had in mind to bring forth this ultimate sacrifice. You might ask, well, Apostle, why is this the case? Why did God plan this before he said, let there be anything? It's very simple. The answer is because love is God and God is love. And love, in order to show itself as a full, complete expression of love, sacrifice must be made. If the sacrifice is not made, it's not love. It doesn't matter what is being said. Sacrifice from the heart, complete total sacrifice, something that costs you to the core, that's the proof of love. Greater love hath no man than this, than that a man laid down his life for his friend. So it's got to be expensive if it's remotely concerning love. That's why the sacrifice was slain before the foundation of the world. God had it in his mind to show love to the creatures that he would make in his image. So the lamb that was slain, knowing that Adam and Eve will sin, he made provision, and this was manifested when the sin was committed. I want you to note that. So God's love covered Adam and Eve, and then he sent them into the world because of their actions in sin. They could not live in eternal, in an, an eternal state of being in sin. And they could not stay in a perfect place because they had sin. So God covered them with the perfect sacrifice and sent them out into the mean, bad world. Where they had to pay the price for their actions. The consequences now will be seen. So that's where we meet Cain and Abel. Two brothers, born and raised together, grew up together, loving each other. Watch this, loving each other, playing together. It's a family. This is the first human family. But they had to come before God in order to deal with their sins. Now, they know that to show love to God, they must give their best. They have to show 
that they love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Abel is smitten in his heart, his conscience is lively. He said, I'm going to bring the best of what I have to offer, the perfect lamb. And he brought that, prepared it as prescribed, offered it unto God. And God was well pleased with the sacrifice of Abel. Now Cain, and I truly believe that he knew how to sacrifice because he must have seen his father Adam sacrifice unto God because Adam got it from God himself. But Cain, wanting to show self-righteousness, religious but lost, brought what he thought was an excellent sacrifice, which is the produce from the ground. But no blood is spilt when you bring something from the ground in the form of a plant. That is not what God prescribed. So he brought that, offered it by fire unto the Lord, and God rejected his offering. No life was given. So it was not accepted as a sin offering. And if you look in the story in Genesis, you'll see the particulars of that particular conversation that God had with Cain. Cain, who loved his brother, now became jealous of his brother. King Solomon put it like this. For a good work, for every good work, a man is envied of his neighbor. Watch out for jealousy. It can even happen in the church. It can happen in a family. It can happen amongst work colleagues. It can happen amongst your friends. Let me tell you, King Solomon said in the Proverbs, a friend that is near is better than a brother far off. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. And we see it with these two brothers here. Don't think because you're flesh and blood and you're connected by blood, and you came from the same womb and you have the same parents, that everything's hunky-dory. Sometimes it is. But as we can see, the first brothers, the first siblings, they were okay until God showed favor on one and rejected the other. Then envy ensued. Now there is a thing called good jealousy because love is jealous. And God is love. And God is jealous. He said, I'm a jealous God. Thou shalt not have any other God before me. Don't worship any other God before me. Don't make an image of a likeness of anything in heaven above on the earth and under the earth or in the sea and don't put it up there and then bow down yourself and worship it because I am a jealous God. So love has a certain amount of jealousy in it. It craves the attention of the object of the affection that is directed towards. The subject, the person, the people that love is shown towards. And if there's no jealousy in love, then it's not really love. I'll tell you that right now. Because love craves attention. And rightly so, because by nature it's love. So, what Cain had was a jealousy that was unholy. It was spawned by Satan in his heart. Because this jealousy did not prompt Cain to do something right. So therefore, God had to address Cain. Say, why are you envious against your brother? If you do good, will I not reward you? And if so, then I'll make you his ruler. You'll have preeminence over your brother. But if you don't change, sin lies at the door. Now God warned him. God had a personal conversation with Cain, the brother of Abel. Did Cain change? No. He's directing his hatred because envy can turn to hatred. 
A good jealousy is, you know what? My brother has done something very, very special. God is pleased with it, so I'm going to outdo him next time. I'm going to give God the best of me. Nothing wrong with that. I will do better than I did previously. Nothing wrong with that. That's good envy. You can provoke someone to righteousness with envy. You can do that. You can make them envious of your good works by provoking them unto good works. But the negative or the flip side of that is they can come against you because you've done that which is right. So they'll have an animosity against you. We have to guard against that. And I'm going to tell you something. Every single one of us human beings, we have the capacity to be envious and jealous. But we must steer it in the right direction or else sin lies at the door. Are you hearing me, someone, today? Sin lies at the door if you are envious against somebody's ability, their gifting, their talents, their skills, their accomplishments, what they're moving towards. Sin lies at the door if you don't check yourself and see the cause of your envy. Is it because your brother or your sister is doing right and you haven't done right and therefore you despise them because of that? That's bad envy. You need to turn that around. And say, look, you know what? If that person can please God and they're just like me, human, then I can please God too, just like they did. And I will do the best that I can do, just like they did. That is good envy. That's provoking to good works. That's jealousy that's provoking to good works. And we should strive to do that for one another. I want to add this to this conversation, to this discussion this evening. Listen carefully. When someone is elevated, when God has blessed someone, when God is lifting someone up, when God is highlighting the good in some worthwhile effort that someone has made, our responsibility is to rejoice with that person. If you don't, and if you don't say, well done, then envy, sin, lies at the door. And envy can turn to hatred. And hate, hatred to murder. You can murder in more ways than one. You can slander someone behind their back. You can kill them with your words in their face. And you can kill them physically. Now, let's see what happened here. These two brothers were in the field one day, away from their parents. They're talking with each other. Abel had no discerning in himself to suspect that his brother would mean him any harm. This is his brother. His blood brother. His only brother on earth. And we were all made to communicate one to another. Talking with his brother. Come on. And Cain picked up something, a tool, and he hit his brother and hit him and hit him and hit him until Abel died. And he took off and ran and pretended that he didn't do anything. He was not sorry for what he did. Instead of checking his own heart, he checked his brother's life and ended it because of jealousy, envy. Didn't like the fact that his brother pleased God and he didn't. So I'm going to make him pay for pleasing God. I should have been the one that God spoke about. I gave the best of my vegetation. But God didn't say vegetation. What God prescribes is what we must do. And disobedience leads always to some sort of a tragedy if it's not checked by repentance. So, obviously, Cain didn't repent. So when he killed his brother, he wasn't remorseful either. He just went about his business. So God spoke to Cain and said, Cain, where is your brother? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? What have you done? His blood cries from the ground. So the scripture says here that God testified of Abel's gifts and by his gift, by the gift, the sacrifice 
from his heart unto the Lord the best that he could give. He being dead yet speaketh. So when you give something that's worthwhile unto the Lord, the best to the master, even when you're no longer alive, your gift will speak for you and bring you before great one, the great one, the most high, the great I am. Your gift unto the Lord will never die. It is an everlasting gift because it's the expression of your love to Him. So when you give the sacrifice of praise, it will always sound in God's ears. When you give your life, your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is reasonable. If He saved you, it's reasonable. As Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, that you might prove that which is good and perfect and acceptable as His will for you in this life. When you do something like that, your works will follow you out of this life into the everlasting. Because it's invested in the kingdom of God Most High. And He is eternal, therefore efforts to please Him is eternal. That's why Abel, though he was dead and his blood ran on the ground, crying unto the Lord for justice, his good work spoke for him and said, Lord, I've done excellent work. And because of this, I have suffered loss of my life before the time. And God said, this is a righteous man. And he's the first martyr of the human race. And to this day, his blood is speaking. I want justice for this heinous act. Because when you do righteous before God, it's not to say that bad things will not happen. But bad things won't happen all the time and it won't affect you negatively all the time. There will be an ending to bad works and your good works will march on with you beforehand into eternity. Because from the time you do this act, it goes before God as a sweet smelling savor unto him. And even when you're off the scene, it remains. It's kind of like winning, winning the Olympics forever ever. Praise the Lord because God is not unrighteous to forget your works and labors of love. He will never forget. So don't worry about what happens in this world. Sometimes we can be discouraged. We can be even depressed as a child of God. Yes, you can. One of the greatest men that ever walked the face of this earth, Elijah, was depressed after he did so many things, raised, the very first man to raise anybody from the dead. He, he spoke and he said, there won't be any rain on this land of Israel except at my word. And it didn't rain for three years and six months. Then he prayed earnestly again and it rained, for, rained right after that. Thunder showers just came down. And he, he wiped out false worship out of the land of Israel killed 450 prophets of Baal and 400 other false prophets amongst the children of Israel caused the nation to turn back to the living God prayed to God to answer by fire the sacrifice that was laid on the altar swimming with water and the sacrifice licked up the, the animals that were laid on that sacrifice just swimming with liquid water from the sea and it was like oil on the, the altar the sacrifice burnt up the water burnt up and the very rocks were on fire because of that man's faith and yet one woman caused that man to get depressed and that was Jezebel this woman that is assigned to assassinate men of God prophets of God and she spoke a word and said I'm going to kill this man within 24 hours that was enough to make the great Elijah who was seen on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses talking with Jesus the representation of all the prophets in the Old Testament Elijah caused him to run and be depressed even when he ate angels food depressed even when he ate angels food twice still depressed even when God was speaking to him, why are you here on the Mount Sinai? My son, my prophet, because that woman that made us fret and I'm done. I'm finished prophesying. He said, I'll tell you what, I'm giving you a new assignment. 
do this, do that, do the next thing. And by the way, you're not going to die. You're going up to be with me forever. I'm coming to Elijah. I'll come down to Elijah in this chapter. God willing. But what I'm saying here is there are times when you may be depressed. You may be hard hit by the forces of darkness to make you think and feel like the moment you're in is the be all to end all. No. What you have done, that which is righteous before God, has gone up before him. And I'm telling you now, life does not consist in the abundance of the things that you possess. You may even suffer loss of possessions. You may not have cash in the bank. And we tend, even God-fearing people, tend to believe that our worth is borne out by the possessions that we have. Hallelujah. How much money is in the bank? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you, as we will look and see in this chapter, Hebrews 11, there are some that were so holy, they couldn't even be around other human beings. Society was not worthy to have them amongst them because that society, that community was so evil they had to leave. Remember Lot in Sodom? He had to leave. God couldn't destroy that place until that holy man left. So you, my friend, who are following Yeshua, Jesus Christ, with all your heart, soul, mind and strength, you might be at the place where you're thinking, what's the use? I've, I've done good in vain. Others seem to get in ahead in life and, and I'm broke and I'm, and I'm forgotten and I'm solitary and I'm just left alone. No, you're not. If you're walking before God in spirit and in truth, you're not alone. In fact, if you have the Holy Ghost in you, you have the power of the Most High and you can turn around and you can say to your situation, be uprooted and be cast into the sea of forgetfulness because you have the power to do so. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you have the almighty power of God in Christ to rebuke your situation and cast it into the depths of the sea. In the name of Yeshua, it shall be done unto you, if you believe. Because by faith, Abel offered up a more excellent sacrifice unto God than his brother Cain. And God testified of it that this is acceptable unto me. And even when he was dead, God remembered his sacrifice. That's what God will do for you. He'll change your situation around too. Did he not do that for Elijah? The very woman that threatened him. The Lord turned Elijah and sent him against Jezebel. And when he came back for her, she was shaking in her bridges. She couldn't say a word to the man of God when he came down with the authority and power of God and rebuked that demon, that devil that was in her and told her what her end will be. And she shook and was scared even to the day of her death and she couldn't mess with the man of God. For it is written, Touch not the Lord's anointed and do his prophet no harm. Not to say that we won't suffer in this life. But through our sufferings, God will deliver us from them all. Whatever your path is in this life, whether it's a long path or whether it's a short one, if God is in it, it's a great one. The Lord bless you as you hear these words. And let your life, like Abel, be a living sacrifice unto God. Your body, soul, and spirit, let it be holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and let him be pleased with you and make it to the end of your journey so that you will be taken up into his glory. May God bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord, Yahuwah, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace that passes all understanding. In the name of the Prince of Peace, Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus Christ, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen.